Hello, I'm Michael Littlecrow, and I want to take this brief time to share with each of you, my students, uh, techniques that have helped me not only to learn math, but to teach and to bring greater happiness into my life. So this little segment, Math, Stress, and the Path to Happiness. Finding the greatest teacher is already available to you right within your own self. So let's get started. Where the stress in math comes from is something, it's a small part of the brain. It's called the amygdala. So you'll see it uh, right here, the amygdala, little part right here in the brain. And there is sort of the job of the amygdala is to remember emotions. And that's great most of the time, but there are oftentimes when we've had stressful situations, those are also stored right there in the amygdala. And we're going to take a look at just a little research that has been done to see the effects of negative emotions being stored in the amygdala in terms of math problem solving. So these researchers have come from an article in uh, Education Week 2011. Uh, here's what they found. They says, when first taking in a problem, a student processes information through the amygdala, the brain's emotional center. During stress, there is more activity in this amygdala than in the prefrontal cortex. Um, and even a minor stressor, such as seeing a frowning face before answering a question, can decrease a student's ability to remember and respond accurately. Remember, these are all been done through research. This has told, taught me as a teacher to always be positive, encouraging, smiling, these are important things because we pick up on this, the emotional side of learning. Well, there's more. The study also found that when engaged in mathematical problem solving, highly math anxious individuals suffer from intrusive thoughts and ruminations, stuff from the, that we remembered from the past that maybe wasn't so positive for us, maybe brought us down. Those things come in. And this is what takes up some, or some of us, all of our processing and working memory. It's very as much as though the individuals with math anxiety use up the brain power they need for the problem on worrying. I know this firsthand. Uh, and so, is there any good news to this? So far, all the stress, maybe you're feeling more stress right now, but here's the good news. The good news is that this stress reaction may hit hardest the students who might otherwise be the most enthusiastic about math. So if you've been stressed out about math, if you've struggled about math because of this issue, the good news is if you can find a way to overcome the intrusive emotions that go from the amygdala, you could really find a great joy in math and great success. If you're already good at math, and that's maybe you've already found this way, that's great too. But I think you might find some benefits from what I'm going to share with you in the next few slides. First of all, the brain function, uh, here's the right side of the brain. The right side of the brain seems to control the left side of the body and uh, vice versa. So here's the emotional memory. That's the amygdala, remember. Uh, and when things are stuck in here, nothing else seems to happen. Well, the math part of the brain's up here, and working with students, they've noticed, uh, I, I teach math using the hands, and what we've noticed is that by using these hands, these fingers, which is further up in the brain, we take the, uh, the emotions that might be stuck down here, we're able to free the brain up to go to the fingers, because usually there's not too much negative associated with using our fingers, and then it's easier to get access to the part of the brain that needs to do the math. That's the right side. And we'll see a similar situation happens on the left side. The emotional memory, the amygdala down in here, the fingers up a little bit higher. Again, the left brain controlling the right fingers. Um, and then also on the left side, that's the part of the uh, math symbols. So up in here on the left side, we get access to 
uh, symbolic region reasoning okay so far so good simple technique just use your hands um, to gain access to greater math abilities but along with that there's other ways of moving forward and so these techniques that I'm going to share with you come from ancient India this is a map of the world uh, as it says up there in the corner of 475 AD so 1500 close to you know around 2000 years ago the, the world looked mostly like this not that there weren't other people on the other side of the world we uh, in the Americas we've got uh, evidence that shows uh, a number of us people were living over on this the other side of the world uh, for 20 to 30,000 years at least uh, but over here what we see is the modern world um, the center part of the modern world which we think of that influences a lot of our educational systems really was this little part of the sort of subcontinent area that we refer to now as India and from this region um, 3,000 years ago three to five thousand years ago there was great concentration on how does the brain work what's the way we can make our learning successful and so what I'm going to share with you today comes from these time periods and has been passed down through the centuries by noble teachers um, to help their students gain success in learning and greater happiness in life so one of the things that these teachers help their students to realize that who we are comes from what we do so we are the owner of our actions what we do the actions we do create who we are in the eyes of others and in our own eyes and we can separate our actions into two groups we have skillful actions and unskillful actions one definition of skillful actions is that there are actions that accomplish what we're trying to have accomplished. We're getting success, we feel skillful. But additionally, in India, they laid one more rule that skillful actions also do not cause harm to others or to the self. Because if we harm something, that is not skillful. If we harm our environment, if we harm the humans around us, if we harm ourselves, that is not skillful. Those are unskillful actions. Sometimes we take great pleasure in unskillful actions. But if we learn two things, we learn two skills. First, to recognize what skillful actions are, and then to develop them. As we see things being skillful, not causing harm, but moving us forward, we develop those skills more fully. When we notice something as being unskillful, that possibly we're causing harm to others or our environment then what we want to do is abandon those we might not be able to leave them off as they say cold turkey but we want to do them less and less and less move our actions to the skillful side more and more and more and this is how it it worked from ancient India to the modern day there's three actions that are involved in developing the ability to spot skillful actions from unskillful and that developing of concentration so we're going to talk about mindfulness alertness ardency let me explain these maybe in um, more specific terms because uh, especially mindfulness you might hear of that and there's different definitions in india what they uh, looked at mindfulness simply as it was the matter of keeping something in mind our memory of something so in math the mindfulness might be remembering the multiplication tables remembering processes and formulas uh, and in daily life we might need to be rem mindful and remembering about uh, what are common courtesies and such mindfulness alertness is being able to have active attention on a particular item and again in math class maybe we're focusing active attention on a particular topic a particular problem um, in life a particular subject that we're going to focus on and then along with that if we tie in the ardency which is the intense feeling that brings in our emotions and our effort uh, to develop our concentration by taking the mindfulness the active attention 
um, and the ardency, putting them all together in a way that helps us develop concentration. So a technique involved in this is simply to direct our thoughts. So that's maybe the mindfulness part, remembering to direct our thoughts on something, focusing on a math problem, or as we'll talk in a moment, maybe focusing on something that's going on in the body. Once we focus our thoughts on something, we evaluate it. Are, is our thoughts being skillful? Are they getting us to where we want to be? If not, we make adjustments. We redirect our thoughts until we get the success we're looking for. When we find that success, joyful feelings arise. Success always feels good. Um, and then when we have that joyful feeling, we redirect our thoughts because when we find pleasure and joy, we want to do it more. Okay. So it's sort of a circular thing. Um, sometimes we feel the joy first and, hey, this is a good thing. I'm enjoying myself. I want to do it some more. So then I redirect my thought to doing that activity. And as I'm doing that activity, if I evaluate how things are going. When it's not going as well as I would like, instead of giving up, I try to redirect it so I can adjust things so that it's going in a skillful manner. I feel the joy again, and then I keep directing my thought evaluation, joy fulfilling, and I get this one-pointed concentration on doing the activity I'm doing. You might find this in sports. Um, certainly we'll find this in learning and in all activities in our life. So one exercise that they used from ancient India was something that we carry all with us. Now, if you're an athlete, you might go to the gym to work up your muscles and build the strength that way. For learning, what we found is that what we have with us that connects our mind with our body, with our ability to do uh, skillful activities, is the breath. The breath connects us with the inside and the outside of the world. And so the activity is to direct our thoughts simply to the thought of breathing itself. I am breathing in. Yes, I am breathing out. To direct our thought and just focus on the breathing. We can breathe in long and then breathe out long. Or we can breathe in short, breathe out short. Breathe in long, breathe out short. Breathe in short, breathe out long. So we have all these combinations of ways we can breathe. But what we want to do along with just watching the breath is evaluating it. How does the breath feel? Is it comfortable? If not, make an adjustment because a good breath can really help us to relax. And the breath is not just air coming into the lungs and out of the lungs. Remember, as air comes in, that oxygen goes throughout the body. And when we feel that breath energy going through our bodies, and we let that breath energy evaluate where is there stress. Let's calm that part of the body down. Let's relax it. We're actually able to get to a place where we feel relaxed, concentrated, and focused. And that's when the joy arises. When we get the pleasurable breath, just let it spread through the body. This simple activity can be done in one or two minutes when you feel stress, close your eyes. It's helpful to block out the outside um, stresses that might be piling on and just focus on the breath, breathing in, breathing out, making that breath help the body to relax. You'll build that concentration, that one-pointed focus, and you'll be able to go forward. My suggestion, this is what worked for me, I would spend say two minutes, one minute, two minutes, whatever you need, just before I'm going to go study. And by doing that, connecting my mind and my body through the activity of watching my breath, evaluating the breath, making it pleasurable and good, uh, I found myself, I'm, I'm more focused and able to learn. I'm energized. I'm able to work through my studies faster, learn deeper, and retain it longer. That was skillful in my works. And so then I would do it again. 
because I found more joy in study. It wasn't always that way, but it it has gotten to be that way. So how did I learn about these things? Well, I want to give a shout out to my teacher, uh, a doctoral student at Arizona State University, um, Luan Pintan. Her, she goes by Bo. Uh, she put together a three-day uh, mindfulness retreat that has been uh, enjoyed by others, including myself. I, I've had benefit to go through it uh, at least three times. Uh, I've also had shorter versions of it, but that's where I, I picked this up. Uh, and she calls it the Mindful Education, Mindful Life Workshop. Um, it's very powerful. Uh, you'll see on our website, Open Global Village, we have uh, a section where there are some guided meditations. There's a five minute guided meditation that, that's very helpful. It's short. There's a, I think a 20 or 30 minute, I can't remember how long, but it's, it's really good because she, she guides you through the meditation for a while, lets you kind of continue on your own, and then helps you ease back out of the meditation, bringing joy and happiness to yourself and to your life. So by using mindfulness, you'll find greater success in your studies, greater success in your life, happiness in both. I hope you experience the same joys and the same happiness that I have from using these techniques. Good success and good happiness in your life and learning.